Jeremy. Hi. Uh, welcome to Blogging Heads. Uh, this is the first time I know you've done this, so we'll try to make it really painless. Um, what, I, what I'm hoping is that you have such a good time having this discussion that you tell all your colleagues at, at Brookings uh, how, how much fun Blogging Heads TV can be, and they'll want to join you. Uh, in this. I'll, I'll give it a shot. They're a tough crowd, but we'll see. <laughs> so maybe you want to introduce yourself, uh, say something about what you do at Brookings and, and what brought you there. Sure. Uh, my name is Jeremy Shapiro. I'm the uh, Director of Research for the Center on the United States and Europe uh, at Brookings, and I'm also a Fellow in Foreign Policy Studies, which is a, a very long title to say essentially that I study uh, transatlantic relations. I came from another think tank, uh, the RAND Corporation, where I worked a lot with the Pentagon, and I've been doing uh, U.S.-European relations here for about five years. Okay. Well, um, speaking of uh, European relations, the, 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 the two things that I, I think we're going to talk about today most are Afghanistan, a recent trip that you just took there with NATO, and maybe we can uh, briefly you know, talk about the recent French election, since that's also an area of your expertise. So do you want to uh, just say a little bit about how you came to be on this, uh, I won't call it a junket because you were in Afghanistan, um, how, how you came to get on this, you know, what, what, what basically you did in, in Afghanistan with NATO? Uh, sure. NATO has a program that they call the Transatlantic Opinion Leaders Afghanistan. They've taken now, I was on the sixth uh, trip, and they round up about uh, ten think tank people and journalists uh, and they send them to uh, Afghanistan to, uh, in their view, try to understand what's going on there, try to understand what NATO's doing, and try to impress on people both the importance of the mission and, the, uh, uh, and the, in, in their view, of course, the good work that NATO is doing there. So my particular trip was about uh, nine days. Uh, we went uh, one day to Pakistan, uh, to Islamabad, to get the Pakistani view on what's happening in Afghanistan. Uh, and then we went um, to, uh, to Kabul uh, and uh, to um, Herat in the, in the west of Afghanistan, to Kandahar in the south of Afghanistan, which is the area of most intense fighting, uh, and to Mazari Sharif in the north of Afghanistan. Uh, and I said the trip was about nine days. I, I think it's. I think a lot of people might not understand. At least I wasn't aware that the, the that NATO actually has the majority of foreign forces in Afghanistan. And it, I mean, is that still correct? NATO's. What What are NATO troop levels right now? I mean, not to uh, put you on the, the spot. But the, the operation in Afghanistan is organized in an extraordinarily complex manner. I think, as a British general told me, uh, no sane person would ever devise a command structure like that. In fact, there are two uh, semi-separate operations in Afghanistan. One is run by NATO and is called the International Security Assistance Force. It started in Kabul and gradually spread out to the entire country. And as of about October of last year, it, it is responsible for security and stability and reconstruction and development in all of Afghanistan. There are about uh, 40,000 troops in that operation, about, um, I think about 12,000 of them are American, and the rest come from every NATO nation, which is uh, 25 more countries, plus 11 non-NATO uh, countries, so 37 nations in total, about 40,000 troops, somewhat less than half of them American. There is a separate uh, uh, operation which is charged with counterterrorism in Afghanistan, which is an American-run operation and is uh, mostly American troops. It's about 12 to 15,000 uh, American troops right now. That's sometimes called Operation Enduring Freedom. They've officially changed the name, but the old name has stuck, and its, it's official name is now uh, Combined Joint Task Force 82. Okay, so the, so the sort of state-building uh, uh, troops, the uh, I know they're not wearing blue helmets, but the, but the sort of nation-building re, um, reconstruction is, is sort of a predominantly NATO exercise. And the, that's right. the hunt for bin Laden uh, is, uh, you know, a separate thing that's, that's run by the United States. I mean, I, I think a lot of people... Right, but increasingly the truth is that it's very hard to distinguish between those tasks. Uh, and it's certainly true that NATO is involved, uh, the ISAF mission is involved in some very high-intensity operations, some things which are called uh, state building but look very much like war. 
uh, and, it, and they have to coordinate a great deal with the American troops. And the coordination became difficult enough last year that um, they, what they did is dual hat they, what they call dual hat, which is mean, means that they put the commander of Operation Enduring Freedom, uh, an American general, into the command structure of NATO. So, they're, so although they're separate operations, the commander is involved in both, uh, which is supposedly to ha help um, coordinate operations. And increasingly those operations are less and less separate, but there's a political problem there which is that, especially in the European countries, they don't want to be involved in these counterterrorism operations. They conceive of them as what they call too kinetic, too militarily focused. Uh, and so they, um, uh, they keep the operations separate, but the truth is uh, they're really not. So now, when you were there, I understand you visited you, you visited different you, you visited sectors under command of, under the command of different um, European countries: Italy, France, and Germany. And each of them kind of had their own idiosyncrasies. Do you want to sort of explain something about how that say, say something? Yeah, about? that's very interesting. Um, so actually, with the ones that I visited were uh, the, uh, the in addition to the Americans were the Italians, the Germans, and the uh, British. Okay. Uh, who each have a regional command. Uh, and what's interesting about, one of the things that's interesting about Afghanistan is that as you visit the different parts, it, it seems like a very different place. Uh, it's a very decentralized country already, and the structure of the NATO mission, whereby it's run by different countries, means that each country that is uh, sort of the, in charge of a different region puts its own stamp. And there's sort of a combination of the difference in local contexts and the difference in national approaches which makes uh, visiting each of these bases seem like um, going to an entirely different place. Hmm. So first we went to uh, the west in Herat, which is the most developed part of Afghanistan, uh, probably the most safe, although they certainly have um, bombings there. Uh, and it's run by the Italians, and the Italians have created uh, a certain relaxed style uh, they are very uh, interested in mixing with the community, um, and they put a big premium on that. Uh, they've created a base which is uh, very Italian, has a wonderful uh, restaurant. I, I, re I recommend the pasta. The, the lobster tail, I think, was a bit frozen, but uh, a, the idea that you're uh, sitting there in the middle of a landlocked country in Herat, Afghanistan, eating lobster tail is a strange comment on the way NATO does business. Um, they, the Italians, took us out to see the town in a regular bus. Uh, I, I, I suppose there was some danger, but they insisted it was not a problem. Uh, then we went to um, the south, to Kandahar, which is run by the British, which has the most uh, combat of any area of Afghanistan. Uh, and this was a very, very tense place. Uh, the people who uh, were uh, living there were uh, clearly very stressed, uh, very tired, and uh, very uh, busy with very difficult and important uh, operations, life and death operations every day. And you could see it on their faces. Um, I mean, and do you they think it's really by intention, didn't. just just to interrupt for a second, is it you know the, the, the different operating styles that, that that the UK and Italy have? Is it is it by design that the UK is given the harder task, where the Italians get to, you know, draw on their gregarious people skills to, uh, you know, I uh, mean, is it is that by design? I don't think or that not? the design is that conscious, um, but there are. Uh, I mean, the thing about the NATO operation is that every soldier there really. Uh, reports essentially to two different chains of command. Uh, first he reports to the NATO chain, but then he also reports to his national command, uh, to his home government. And uh, they each have very different uh, political demands on the operation. Uh, the Italians are, um, don't have sufficient political will, sufficient popular support for the operation at home to be uh, involved in, in the South, where the operations are of great intensity, and they haven't been willing to go South. Um, and so they've, uh, they've been given that area to reflect the political willingness. There is a great um, 
need in NATO to accommodate those types of demands. And I, I wouldn't want to pick on the Italians here. Uh, every country has uh, what they call caveats, ways in which they will accept that their forces can be used, uh, including the Americans, by the way. Um, and that really does shape the NATO operation. Uh, and so the Italians are in Herat. Uh, less because they conceived that they would be good at dealing with Herat, but rather because that's what they'll do. Right, right. Well, I think that that's really that that's really interesting uh, a commentary on how NATO really has to operate, balancing these national requirements and demands against the local needs on the ground. And so, you, you know, the British, you know, you were saying, are kind of in a harder area of operation. Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, they. Um, uh, you can see, um, you know, the uh, the rapid reaction forces moving out of that base. Even in the one day that I was there, uh, they we never left the air base um, in Kandahar when we got there. Uh, they this simply they were too nervous about uh, the security requirements, and maybe even more importantly, they were just too busy. Uh, to really deal with us, and I was quite sympathetic to that. It was frustrating to come all the way to Kandahar, Afghanistan, and sit in a conference room and watch PowerPoint right. um, uh, presentations, but uh, it, would be, it was difficult to ask more of them. Uh, and then um, the, last, the, the, the last national context I saw was, was in Masri Sharif in the north, which was really very, very interesting. That's a uh, that region is run largely by the Germans. Uh, it, it should be said just to clarify that there are many different countries in all of these regions. When I, when I say it's run by the Germans, they're in charge of that, mm -hmm. of that region. Uh, and they are building in the north of Afghanistan uh, a really a city-like um, uh, military base. It's, it, it has a very, very permanent feel to it. They've built... Uh, an 18 million euro hospital there, which I venture to say is the nicest hospital in Central Asia. I would definitely recommend if you decide to get sick in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. you do it in Masri Sharif. Um, and uh, they are uh, quite obsessed with force protection, so very, very few German soldiers uh, leave that base and mix with the population. Um, and uh, the situation there has gotten a little bit, it's, it's been fairly calm, actually, in the last few years. Uh, but just recently, just in the past few months, uh, the, the insurgents have had a strategy of trying to, to spread their uh, attacks. They, were, they weren't very successful last year at attacking en masse in the south. So they have smaller attacks uh, all around the country. In the north has been a focus. They, they seem to perceive that the Germans are uh, politically weak uh, and really aren't very, won't, won't politically be able to uh, sustain casualties. Uh, and so there have been uh, not only a few attacks up there, but a lot of intelligence that there will be more attacks. And the, uh, there's a, a certain nervousness um, on the German base, which I think is probably different than it would have been a year ago. Um, there, there's one one interesting thing that I think you um, discussed when you were there was uh, the opium issue and how how NATO how, how NATO right. feel, uh, NATO has a specific mandate along with U.S. forces to uh, work toward opium eradication and and there are some I think sophisticated efforts underway to persuade Afghan farmers not to grow opium, but in practice. I, I, th I, I think you learned something different. Maybe you want to explain a little bit about, about that and NATO's approach. Right. It's a very uh, complex and controversial topic, and, and uh, I had difficulty getting insight into it. I think I got a, a little. Um, NATO, uh, so there, uh, NATO is, is, is not, very, is not uh, tasked with opium eradication. That's a, that is a, officially the job of the Afghan government and the Afghan uh, army and police. Um, but they are tasked with supporting um, uh, the Afghan government in that, which means that if the Afghan government in the process of eradication uh, encounters trouble, NATO needs to respond and support them. Um, and uh, the controversy about eradication 
is that uh, it, it, uh, there seems to be, uh, here I'm speculating, but there seems to be a fair amount of consensus within NATO that eradication isn't a very effective way to combat um, opium production and to combat the, the corruption and the uh, drug use that comes from opium production because um, eradication essentially means destroying the fields that uh, opium is grown in. Um, but what the problem is that uh, opium production is really woven into the economy there. And uh, the uh, opium growers are, uh, they're sort of growing on spec, essentially. They've borrowed money from warlords or even from the insurgents themselves uh, to finance their crop. If the crop is destroyed, they are essentially impoverished. Uh, and, and they and find they're, themselves... And they're in debt to the, to the warlords or to the insurgents. Right. They find themselves uh, in debt uh, they find to the insurgents, and they can't pay the money back. Um, so they, at that point, they basically have two choices. They can either uh, join the insurgency, leave their land, uh, or they can uh, double their crop next year uh, in order to try to pay back the debt. There really is no way that they could uh, substitute an alternative crop and hope to get that kind of yield. And, and what's interesting is that the eradication has increased the amount of money they need to make from their land. Uh, and um, they are also, because they're in debt to the insurgents and the warlords, these people want them to grow opium. They don't want them to grow other crops. Um, so uh, what ends up happening is that, uh, in many people's view, is that eradication feeds both the insurgency by providing recruits to it, uh, and it actually creates more opium production because it means that next year they have to grow more and there's just too many fields for the Afghan government to keep coming back to. And certainly the statistics seem to bear that out. Uh, eradication has, has not uh, decreased uh, opium production. Opium production has been growing uh, by leaps and bounds in Afghanistan over the past few years to the point where it's now really responsible for about 90% of the opium in the world. Is there really established by experts um, a causal link between the Karzai government's eradication initiatives and their fail. I mean, I mean, is it is it really that we're and, and, and the insurgency stepping in and I mean, why? I mean, I'm just why hasn't the government well, been the more thing artful? Is that, uh, eradication. Um, I frankly believe, uh, although I, 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 it's very difficult to point to specific causal mechanisms, that this causal link does exist, and I think that that frankly, most people on the ground in Afghanistan would probably agree with me, although they would be very unlikely to admit it. Um, the, the problem here is a political problem more in the United States and Europe uh, than uh, a problem understanding what the dynamics of eradication are in Afghanistan. It's simply unacceptable in the U.S. Congress, for example, and in, in many European countries, to say that we are uh, occupying a country that is producing 90% of the world's opium, that is, that is essentially uh, the source of the heroin, which is a scourge on uh, the streets of both the U.S. and Europe, uh, and that we are not attempting to do something about it. Right. Right. Uh, and that, we're, and that the, 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 these sort of complex arguments that I just made uh, mean that we can't um, attack these farmers who are, uh, attack the fields, attack the opium that are poisoning our kids. That's not a very politically acceptable argument. If you tried to make that argument in the U.S. Congress, you would uh, first be crucified and then not, not re-elected. Um, so uh, but, this but you filters out down. The, but you pointed out that the, that the uh, eradication initiatives are the, really the province of the, of the, of the government, not, not NATO. They, uh, so that's true, so but they are... They can, uh, they can come up with some creative, smart ways to, to figure out how to persuade they, the farmers not to go into debt to the warlords? I mean, uh, I'm just... They, they can, I, I think, per perhaps, and they're trying, to be fair. Um, but uh, that's, not, that's not an easy task. Uh, there aren't, as I said, there aren't a lot of alternative crops, um, and it's very woven into the economy, and the government has uh, limited sway, and they're getting a lot of pressure 
from the U.S. government especially, but also from some European governments, um, to demonstrate some progress on this issue. And most of the sort of uh, more complex alternative ones show less progress, take longer time. Here they can say, well, look, and they often do say, we have eradicated uh, X number of hectares of opium fields, uh, of poppy fields this year. Uh, and this is, these are true statements, I think. But the, the issue here is that the dynamic actually conceivably makes the, the problem worse. Right. Well, shifting a little bit from opium to kind of, you know, other, I think, per, you know, perceptions of the conflict in Afghanistan is that the insurgency is getting worse there, not better, after yeah. uh, six years. And um, maybe you want to share some thoughts about what you, where you think the insurgency is. Uh, you know, just this week, I guess after you returned, there was an incident in which some um, Afghan police fired on American soldiers who, right. who th thinking they were Taliban and the U.S. forces fired back, killing, you know, seven or uh, six or seven Afghan police. So there's, you know, really daily, daily combat there. And, and yeah. certainly there's the perception that the insurgency is growing, the Taliban-controlled areas are increasing. Maybe you can say something about, you know, what the Taliban does control now relative to what it, it controlled uh, in our 2002 right. and, uh, you know, where you see the insurgency there's going. Um, I, I think whether you think the insurgency are, is worse or better depends on where you start your analysis from. Um, clearly, in, in 2006, there was a resurgence of the Taliban. Uh, and they emerged, I think, from a, from a three- or four-year rest and refit period uh, that was uh, that happened in Pakistan to some degree and also in some of the more remote areas of Afghanistan. And they really went at NATO uh, and they, uh, they challenged NATO on the battlefield in a way that was very, very surprising to a lot of people. Uh, and they specifically aimed at what they perceived to be the weak links of the, um, of the coalition that they could reach, namely the British and the Canadians. Uh, in the south, in Helmand province and in, uh, and in Kandahar. And uh, 2006 was a very, very bad year in Afghanistan. A lot of heavy, heavy combat. Um, and uh, the British and the Canadians were involved in the, in the most extensive combat operations that they've had since the Korean War. Um, but, you know, the... Uh, and so certainly that represented a dramatic worsening of the situation. In the last year, since 2006, things have gotten uh, somewhat better than that uh, because I think to some degree the untold story of 2006 is that that Taliban challenge, which was very significant and very frightening, um, did fail. Uh, the Taliban suffered a very, very serious uh, defeat. You know, it was interesting that they could even mount the challenge, but in the end, the British and the Canadians held. Uh, the Taliban um, were defeated when they massed, uh, and it was uh, dis it, it was quite clear that they couldn't stand up to NATO troops in the open battlefield. So uh, there were all sorts of predictions that uh, it, that 2007 would look like 2006, that there would be a renewed spring offensive by the Taliban. Uh, that spring offensive never appeared. Uh, they, uh, there was no large groupings of Taliban forces that came out to challenge NATO forces like there were in 2006. Uh, there, you know, there are a few conceivably a few different reasons for that. The rains were actually very good this year in Afghanistan, which means that uh, it was harder for the Taliban to recruit off the fields uh, because people were uh, harvesting. Um, but also it's probably true that they, they, they um, began to believe that the strategy that they, that they carried out in 2006 hadn't been very effective. Uh, and so um, it appears as if the strategy that they've uh, undertaken this year is to have smaller attacks, more geographically dispersed, as I said, which essentially consist of uh, suicide bombings, um, 
roadside bombs, um, and small group uh, ambushes. And obviously, these things are, are very serious. The insurgency is is certainly still alive and certainly a huge problem. And there is, as you said, combat operations going on there every day. Um, but uh, it is, uh, I think, a significant improvement from from 2006. Uh, and uh, you know, I I, I sort of uh, in, in the in the voyages through Afghanistan, I, I kind of decided the unofficial motto of the place should be not as bad as Iraq because uh, everywhere you go, they sort of say, gee, we have huge problems here. We have combat. We have insurgency. We have suicide bombings. But, you know, it's not as bad as Iraq. Right. Uh, right. And uh, that's very much the way the military officers compare it. It's quite clear that the insurgency isn't as bad as Iraq. It seems that the distinction is that the population is much more supportive of the occupation. This is perhaps because uh, in Afghanistan they know what the uh, rule of the enemy of the insurgents would be like. They were ruled by the Taliban. And frankly, anybody who's lived under the Taliban would not care to repeat that experience. Right. It really was uh, medieval in every sense of the word. Right. Um, well, and so uh, there is a great deal of support. It is very difficult for the insurgents to operate, in, in, especially in the, in the north and in the west. Uh, and so, uh, I mean, if you want to think about some numbers, uh, NATO has lost 75 soldiers there this year. About half of those are American. Um, you know, that's, uh, that's uh, an improvement on last year. It's, uh, it's, it's a lot of casualties. Obviously, it doesn't compare uh, to right, Iraq, right. and uh, NATO has, um, I think it also needs to be said that in the absence of the Taliban spring offensive, or actually perhaps to preempt the Taliban spring offensive, NATO embarked on an offensive on its own, and it's specifically going into the areas that, um, uh, that it hasn't been in the past few years, and trying to root out insurgent control, uh, and trying to bring uh, to, to, as they say, extend the authority of the Afghan government um, to the more remote areas. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think they've made some slow progress in that. Well, I think so your I, assessment does appear to be somewhat more optimistic than uh, the casual reader of Afghan-related news would conclude, and so I think that that's a, that's a positive thing. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a little bit positive. I think the trends are, uh, are decent there. Um, but there is such hard work to do. And I think the real issue is that as you look at NATO's plan, uh, it's a difficult plan. It, 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 it's not crazy. It could work. It may even be working. Um, but it, what it, what's certain is that it is a 10- or 20-year plan. It is not something which is going to defeat this insurgency in the next year or two. And it's much less clear that the politics... Uh, on the home fronts, both in the United States and Europe, will support or even aware that we have a 20-year plan uh, for Afghanistan. Um, the other big story in the news this week was uh, Nick Burns's um, assertions that uh, there's really conclusive evidence that Iran is supplying the Taliban with with uh, weaponry. Right. And I think un until he said that, conventional wisdom was that the Taliban was getting most of its support from um, scattered former Soviet or Russia or yeah, China, Pakistan, Pakistan especially, but uh, not Iran so much, which had a kind of cordial relationship, which has a cordial relationship with the Karzai government, at, at least the, yeah. certainly the Karzai government. And so a I, very antagonistic relationship, historical relationship. Historically with the Taliban, with the Taliban. right. So, so yeah. it, it was a big, it was, a, it was I think, came as a surprise. That, that he asserted this so uh, categorically. Uh, yeah. Maybe you want to say something about uh, that, whether or di whether this even came up while you were there. It did come up, um, and it, uh, his statement was a surprise to me. I can't really comment on the intelligence, obviously. I can tell you what they told me about this issue when I was there. Uh, we, we discussed this issue particularly with the Italians in the West, which is the province obviously, that borders Iran. Um, and there is no doubt in anybody's mind that there are a lot of arms uh, flowing across that border. 
Uh, that's the root out for opium. It's, the, it's one of the roots in uh, for arms. It's a very porous border, and there's a lot of, um, shall we say, trade uh, going on across that border. And the Italians were quite open about the fact uh, that a lot of arms come in across that border. But they saw it as essentially a commercial activity. Uh, they didn't believe that the Iranian government, certainly many Iranians, but not the Iranian government, uh, was responsible for it or even promoting it. Uh, I guess uh, both Iran and Afghanistan are sufficiently entrepreneurial societies that the government doesn't have to get involved in such an activity to occur, right. for better or for worse. Right. Uh, and they, uh, they, didn't see, they didn't see very sophisticated weapons flowing across that border, which was an indication to them uh, that this wasn't uh, an Iranian government activity. And, and to be fair to Nick Burns, um, they uh, were working on the presumption to some degree that uh, the Iranian government would simply not work with the Taliban. Um, it, it needs to be said that the situation is very, very complex. There are, uh, we, we tend to say Taliban for insurgents. In fact, there are a lot of different uh, insurgent or at least armed groups in Afghanistan, maybe some of which the Iranians um, do support. Uh, the consensus of the Italians was that the Iranians had been helpful in the West. They'd been helpful to uh, development. Well, what would the be Iran's agenda in arming uh, insurgent or Taliban forces? If you look at the subtext of what the Americans said, both uh, Secretary of Defense Gates and uh, Under Secretary Burns. Um, I think the subtext is to make life difficult for the right, Americans, right, right, right. Uh, and uh, the Americans have put this into the context of the overall U.S. Iranian problem, and that's right. I think what's suspicious to a lot of people, right. um, because there is a, a view out there. It's uh, it's common in the region. It's very very common in Europe that the Americans are attempting to whip up a conflict with Iran. Uh, and so uh, they, uh, they see this in the, uh, they, they see the idea that uh, certainly, you know, the U.S. and Ar the Iranians have a, have a multi-dimensional conflict. And so this would be yet another area to express that conflict. Um, but the view in the, in the area is that um, for Iran, Afghanistan is too important uh, to, uh, to privilege the conflict with the United States, if you will, and that they operate in Afghanistan and support the government of Afghanistan because they have interests in Afghanistan and that those are actually, for them, more important than the conflict with the United States. Now, the question that analysts of Iran have in their mind is, well, there are some people in Iran. Iran, Iran is clearly uh, um, not, you know, not ruled by just one party. There are clearly some people in Iran who uh, are more interested in the conflict with the, with the United States than in, with, than in stability in Afghanistan or even in Afghan-Iranian relations. And so they may be trying to stir up the conflict both for Iranian internal reasons and to try to anger the Americans. That's certainly a plausible hypothesis, but I didn't find a lot of support for it uh, in Afghanistan. But was the was the notion that uh, you know Iran stands to benefit? Obviously, the, the, was was the notion that the U.S. is you know seeking to create you know conflict with Iran? Was that were you hearing that from NATO officers or from Afghan your Afghan interlocutors? Um, Neither, to be honest with you. Uh, NATO officers would be more cagey than that. I, I didn't have enough exposure to the Afghans. Uh, where I hear that is, actually, I was just in Europe this past week. I hear that in Europe quite a bit um, from, uh, from policymakers even on the side, certainly from analysts and from the public and in the press. Right. right. I just think that's a, that's a really interesting... Uh, Dichotomy. I would say that is a dominant hypothesis um, really everywhere outside of the yeah, United States. Yeah. Uh, and it comes, of course, from the, um, from the Iraq experience. I've had this conversation roughly a thousand times, with, uh, especially with European uh, uh, colleagues. And the conversation always goes as follows. Uh, I say, you know, that's a conspiracy. It makes no sense. We wouldn't do that. 
And they say, yes, but you did in Iraq. So you can do anything. And I have no answer to that. Yeah, yeah unfortunately, there isn't an answer to that, I think, with, um, with this administration in office. You know, it, it's, it's a great unknown. There is certainly a belief out there. Um, I, actually, I guess that belief is fairly prevalent in the United States. It's dominant outside the United States that the Bush administration is really capable of nearly any deception to, uh, um, t in order to generate these types of conflicts uh, because they, th because they want them. I guess uh, uh, certainly, if you go to Pakistan, that is uh, that that was the, the dominant view. Uh, I personally have a. I'm not a supporter of the Bush administration, but I have a more nuanced view of their um, their actions than that. And I don't believe, and I I have many times tried to convince people that they are not really interested in, uh, or at least as a policy, not right. s not interested in stirring up a, a, a military conflict with Iran. Well, I think that that that's a very is, difficult sell. Is, it is it is a hard sell, but I think that. There's little doubt that the, the military leadership at the Pentagon has zero interest in stirring up a military conflict with Iran, and I think that's that quite right. I think that they hold the day right now. But it's just. A, I would say that if you look, uh, I wrote a book on um, on the uh, transatlantic relations over Iraq, on the Iraq crisis of 2003. If you look at what the president did in order to go to war in Iraq, he did not assemble a very impressive, to put it mildly, international coalition. But the domestic coalition that he assembled was overwhelming. It, it, was, uh, it included about 70% of the U.S. public. It included uh, the U.S. military, which was uh, very on board with this operation. It included the U.S. Congress. It included the Democratic Party. Uh, that coalition uh, doesn't exist at all for Iran. None of those parties right. would be, as you, as you pointed out, and, and the most significant one, as I think you said, is the, is the U.S. military. None of those parties is interested in a war with Iran. I think it would be very difficult even for the President of the United States uh, to initiate a military conflict in those, in those domestic political circumstances. It, it always surprises me in discussions with European diplomats, the French in particular, how really hard line France is on Iran's nuclear program. If you, if you happen to um, attend you know, a conference or a panel with, with any French diplomats, they will often, not, not on the issue of use of military force, but, but on, their, on their opposition to an Iranian nuclear capability, they will you know, be they are extremely tough on the, on the position, for example, that Iran be allowed no enrichment capability. And I think that this, this position of France is, it comes as a little bit of a um, surprise to some people who, who might have concluded that France would take a, take a softer line approach toward Iran. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are in light of um, Sarkozy's win. Uh, you know, what, what are your thoughts about, about France as a conservative versus a progressive um, foreign policy force? Uh, in in the Gulf region, and you know, or just what your observations yeah. are in general about about uh, France's recent election. Well, uh, in terms of Iran, I, I certainly think that the policy will remain the same, and it is, as you said, um, a very firm opposition to an Iranian nuclear program. Uh, probably uh, not so firm as to be willing to uh, use force to prevent it. But, uh, but diplomatically uh, quite firm. Uh, and that is a product of the fact that um, since 2002, really, the British and the French and the Germans have been uh, in charge of the diplomacy with Iran and have been attempting to uh, negotiate a solution to the Iranian program and have, in the process, ac acquired a certain stake in, uh, in success in these negotiations, and certainly uh, an Iranian nuclear program would be, uh, would be failure. It needs also be said that they are a bit worried about what the Americans will do uh, if they don't succeed in getting um, the Iranians to, and, and they're also afraid of what the Israelis will do if they don't succeed in getting the Israelian, Iranians to stop their nuclear program. Uh, so uh, I think they're, I think as you said, they're quite firm on that. I think to some degree the diplomacy is aimed almost as much at the Americans as it is at the Iranians. Uh, and uh, unfortunately the consensus 
uh, in Europe right now, although they've held firm and, frankly, the antics of the Iranian government over the last couple of years with their sort of uh, condemnations of Israel and their denials of the Holocaust have, have made this somewhat easier for the Europeans. Uh, they've held firm, but they, but they have not been successful, uh, and they have not been able to um, move the Iranians off the nuclear program, and I think they've, they've started to really quite despair about their possibilities of doing so. Um, I, in terms of the, f the new French government, which I think was actually your question, uh, the, uh, uh, I don't see major changes uh, in their foreign policy. Af Afghanistan is, uh, well, let me back up. The, the new French president, uh, Nicolas Sarkozy, he ran on a, on a tricky sort of pro-American platform, which was uh, difficult uh, in the French political context. The United States is not terribly popular. Uh, Sarkozy is clearly much more enthusiastic about the United States than most of his predecessors. Uh, and as a matter of fact, his opponents in the election referred to him as a, a neoconservative with a French passport. Um, uh, and as a result, he has felt a need, uh, and probably will feel a need over the first year of his presidency, to create a certain distance between himself and the United States, to just at least demonstrate um, that he has independence of mind, which is very important in the, in the French context, that he has independence vis-a-vis -vis the United States. Uh, and he seems to have, uh, I think, unfortunately, picked out Afghanistan as a place where he can do that. Uh, and so there have been grumbles about uh, withdrawing the French troops uh, from Afghanistan. I think there are about a thousand French troops uh, in ISAF in Afghanistan. So it's a reasonably significant contribution. Uh, and they have a regional command and regional command center. Um, and uh, so that's a potential problem um, in U.S. French relations. It actually comes from the election. But I think actually that's more of an isolated incident. Uh, in general, Sarkozy's efforts are to improve the U.S.-French relationship, uh, which actually is, is, I think, better than most people, has always been better than most people think. They cooperate on a lot of issues. But what Sarkozy is willing to do uniquely is, after having demonstrated his independence of mind, he's going to be willing to uh, elevate the U.S.-French cooperation to the political level and to demonstrate to the French people that, he, that, that France does cooperate with the United States and that he's this is something which he thinks is beneficial to France. Well, I hope you've enjoyed uh, this opportunity to share your, your insights about Afghanistan, which sure. I think are really, really uh, useful. That and was fun. Thank you. For and having uh, me. so I hope you'll I hope you'll uh, you'll be willing to do this again. Sure. Thanks very much. Thanks.